So when Warren asked me to come here, um, he gave me the charge of trying to help uh, further the conversation around the idea of obesity as a disease and going beyond the, the typical type of interaction that a lot of my patients tell me they have with uh, physicians and other healthcare providers is giving them the, the very sort of um, revelatory and, and uh, really, um, I guess, um, not very obvious instruction when it comes to their weight that they should eat less and move more. Most of my patients tell me that what they are looking for from their health care provider is something that does more than point the finger back at them to say, hey, you're just lazy and you're eating too much. And that turns a lot of people off from being engaged in health care. This is why a lot of our patients with obesity have higher rates of cancers because they don't get screened because they had a negative experience with a health care provider Stars, that <laughs> caused them for you. No, 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 no. Got a hot mic there. <laughs> Ashley. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That was pretty quick. He was on that. <laughs> Let's hope not. So there, there are a lot of instances where we as healthcare providers end up doing more harm than good because I think our perception of what obesity is is at the moral level. It's at the level of this person should know better and I'm going to make sure that they know that they're doing things wrong. And what I want to do today is give you a different frame of thinking about that. And I think this follows nicely on what Dr. Baum talked about in terms of understanding for kids the impact of the environment and influences with the, within the environment that shape the behaviors of the family and the outcomes that you observe. And what I want to do is, is sort of go you know, in a, in, into adults and talk about obesity as a disease and then give you a sense of how we think about that from a treatment perspective and hopefully that will stimulate some additional thoughts you might have around this concept and uh, change the paradigm to some extent. So let me get going. Here are my disclosures. <clears throat> what I want to try to do is, is want to set the stage very quickly, again, hitting on this idea of a disease, and then talk about this question of, well, individual behaviors do contribute to the disease. So, so why, why are we you know, spending our time talking about these other things? And I, I think that's an important thing to reconcile, and we need to talk through that very clearly. And then understand that lifestyle therapy is an important part of the treatment, and that that's critical to what we want to do. Um, but not everybody responds to every treatment the same way. The only treatment that I know of that everybody responds to the same way is amputation, <laughs> right? 100% of the time. But there are very few treatments that do that. And then how do we deal with non-response? And, and again, in the context of this disease. All right, so here's the definition of a disease. It's got lots of different components in, in there that you know, focus on things like an abnormally functioning organ or system, um, effects of genetic or developmental errors, some type of toxic exposure, um, ultimately leads to illness, sickness, or an ailment. And I think we, could, we can make a very clear argument that obesity fits into that definition because what we're really talking about is sick fat. Okay? If you think about fat mass as being important and necessary and having a certain biologic function, but when you have abnormal amounts of fat or an abnormal functioning fat mass, then you get into what we would consider an adiposity-based chronic disease. This is actually some new terminology that is going to be you know, sort of pushed out as a, as a way to really sort of think about reframing obesity. So we're not just talking about 
individuals with obesity, but we're actually talking about the idea that it's an adiposity-based chronic disease. And not all fat is bad fat. And even when there's some amount of excess fat, it doesn't mean that it's necessarily, quote unquote, unhealthy at the time. You have a, an interaction between <clears throat> metabolically healthy versus excess body weight or obesity. And you can have individuals who are metabolically healthy with obesity, just like you can have individuals who are metabolically unhealthy but normal weight. We've all seen those people, right? They've got really bad cholesterol, they've got type 2 diabetes, but they've got a normal BMI. So understanding that the amount of fat mass is not the only indicator of disease or risk of disease, and that this can transition over time. And so a lot of the research is looking at, in these individuals who are metabolically healthy but have obesity, is that a permanent state? Or are they just somehow protective, even though they have excess fat mass? Or is that a function of increased fitness? As some would say, fit but fat. So, or does that transition over time? And as we age, we see a change in that function. So we go from metabolically healthy to metabolically unhealthy. Here, I was just gonna give you two examples of how body weight is a heritable trait. It is not Again, just something simply within your control. And I'm going to give you two slides that, that demonstrate that. These are twin studies. And in these particular studies, these twins were overfed. So they were given more food than they needed and expected to gain a certain amount of weight. And what you see here on these axes are change in body weight, OK, over time, or, or change in body weight over time and the certain amount of weight gain. And what you see is that there's a fairly high correlation between twin A and twin B. So if I feed two twins, identical twins, the same amount of food, there's a fair correlation between the amount of weight that I would expect them both to gain. Because genetically, body weight is somewhat pre-programmed. And your response to your environment, i.e. overfeeding, is also somewhat pre-programmed. And furthermore, if you look at where people gain the weight, where do you put those excess calories? You can see there's a very high correlation. Now we go from 0.5 uh, correlation to 0.7 in terms of looking at where people gain their fat mass. And this is visceral fat. So we're looking at twin B versus twin A and where they put the extra fat. You can see that line gets even tighter now when you're looking at just specific categories of where you gain the weight. So it's no mistake that, you know, my father, who was 5'4", had a son who was 5'6", right? I won't ever be Shaquille O'Neal, okay? And that is not in my control. No matter how much I eat or how many times I do stretches to lengthen my body, that's not in my control. And so at some level, Body size is heritable. Obesity is a complex disease. This is a very busy graphic, and the point is just to help you understand, these are all of the things that have ever been mapped out by really smart people to say that might have an impact on energy homeostasis. <coughs> these are the things that are going to have an impact on energy balance whether you lose weight or gain weight in a given environment. And these number of systems, again, out of all of these, how much of this is under voluntary control? Very little of it. <coughs> I think our challenge with obesity is that it is very simply defined. We simply use height and weight as a way to understand and classify individuals with obesity. The problem is, is that <clears throat> that doesn't get at a lot of the complexity that Dr. Baum talked about that we'll talk about. <clears throat> it categorizes individuals for the purpose of treatment, for example, or defines severity, but it doesn't capture much else in terms of information. So if I have an individual in front of me with a BMI of 30, 
that can mean different things for different people. If I have an Asian female with a BMI of 30, that could be very severe disease because of ancestry. If I have a black female with a BMI of 30 but a low waist to hip ratio, she's likely going to be metabolically healthy with low risk of disease. Versus if I have an individual like The Rock in front of me with a BMI of 30, I am not going to call him obese, <laughs> right? Um, so, because he has a large amount of muscle mass. So, a BMI of 30 tells me very little unless I put lots of other pieces of information with that. The other thing that I am really much of a, a, a big advocate for is actually looking at weight trajectory. Because I could take someone who has a BMI of 35 that goes down to BMI of 30, they're going to be very different metabolically than someone who goes from a BMI of 25 to a BMI of 30. That weight trajectory tells me a lot, much, a lot more in terms of information than that cross-sectional look, that snapshot on that, at that one point in time. So if obesity is a disease, why are individual factors like dietary intake and physical activity so critical? To that gentleman's question about the food choices, why is that so important? Why do we think about that as kind of our first stop? Well, I think if we look at any other chronic disease, we would have to admit that lifestyle plays an important role. It's just that historically, we've always focused on lifestyle factors more so in obesity than we have in other disease processes. So for example, we take hypertension or diabetes as comparators, two very prevalent chronic diseases. <clears throat> but I think we would all agree that there are environmental, genetic, and behavioral influences in all of them. There's some level of personal responsibility, if you will, for all of these. But from an environment standpoint, people who live in a high sodium environment have higher blood pressure over time. This is very, very clearly shown in lots of epidemiologic research. People with <clears throat> exposure to endocrine disruptors have increased risk of developing type 2 diabetes. The same is true for individuals who live in neighborhoods with higher numbers of fast food restaurants. They have a higher pro probability of having obesity. Genetically, there's a contribution of family history and multiple genes to all of these diseases. And then there's individual behavior choices. Right? If I choose to salt my food before I taste it, I might likely have higher blood pressure. Or if <clears throat> I don't take my medication for my type 2 diabetes, then my blood glucose control may be poor. Or if I you know, have sleep apnea and don't use my CPAP, then I may gain weight and that may lead to obesity. So, all of these things are involved. The question is, or the problem, the challenge, has been that we focus on the individual lifestyle choices way more for obesity than we do for lots of other chronic diseases. And I think some of that may be because we've historically felt like we haven't had much to do in terms of treatment. So for diabetes, I can write the prescription. For hypertension, I can write the prescription. For obesity, it's always turned back to the patient. Well, this is what you have to do. Here's some other examples of things that I commonly see in my patient population that, that influence body weight. And <clears throat> this, these are all examples that I could pull from from the past week of clinic. Medications like steroids or antipsychotic medications. A lot of my patients are on insulin. And they, they've told me, you know, I was doing just fine. Blood sugar kept creeping up a little bit, got put on insulin, gained 10 pounds. Didn't do anything different. Hypothalamic obesity. I see a young woman who, at the age of 14, had a pituitary tumor uh, removed, pituitary adenoma. Her mother says the day after her surgery, she ate more food than she had in the previous week. There was a, there was a dramatic change in her <clears throat> level of ability to be satiated. She developed a hyperphagia. And without any other insult, it was all related to that particular procedure. 
And so until she got more complex treatment, she never had any success in terms of being able to manage her weight after that procedure. Comorbid depression or anxiety. Food is a very reliable increase uh, or reliable producer of increased levels of serotonin and dopamine. There's, there's a very reliable response. And so if I learn that eating those potato chips makes me feel better after having a very difficult conversation, then I'm gonna keep going back to that. Sleep disorders are people who work night shifts, third, third shift. I see this all the time. This is why WHO has classified night shift working as a, as a, uh, as, as a cancer causing uh, work environment. Because you dysregulate the circadian rhythms, you throw off the ability to manage appetite. And then the environment, <laughs> things like that we know of and that Dr. Baum already talked about in terms of lack of access to healthier spaces and foods, food insecurity, um, interestingly enough, is paradoxically associated with excess weight gain. And, and if you just take a moment and think about it, think about if you could not predict when you were going to have your next meal, i.e. residency, you would eat as much as you could whenever you could, right? And if you have that chronic stress every day for, the, for a long period of your life, you're gonna gain weight over time because you're gonna get the cheapest thing you can get to make it go the farthest, and that's likely gonna be high energy dense food. So even though you don't have access to food consistently, you still gain weight. So, Hopefully I've convinced you that it's a complex disease that's simply defined. Behavior is important, but it's not the only influence. And if, if you can agree with me on that, then I think we can go to the next phase. Most people agree? I can continue? All right. So here are the goals of anti-obesity treatment. Initiate and sustain an energy deficit, but we want to preserve fat, lean mass while we lose fat mass. And then we want to resume our energy balance once we achieve the new lower weight. But this has to account for the changes that happen from an energy homeostasis standpoint once we've lost the weight. So it's not just simply, hey, you lose weight and then you're good. The body is, has adapted to the process of losing weight. And we've got, to be, we've got to be able to understand how to manage that. So here's our basic sort of law of thermodynamics slide. <clears throat> calories in, calories out. We've kind of all heard that before. Energy expenditure is generated in a few ways. You have your metabolism, so that's your basic needs to keep your body activities going the way you need to. You have activity energy expenditure. This is your voluntary activity. Um, it's also what we think of as non-energy or uh, non-activity energy thermoge thermogenesis. So just fidgeting, or you know, the person who can't quite sit still. That person always seems to be thin, right? Well, they're burning calories just because their muscles are always twitching. And then the thermic effect of food. So just by digesting food, you're burning calories to get the nutrients out of that. Energy intake is decreased in a couple of ways. And that's primarily through reducing food intake or changing how that food is absorbed, absorbing fewer calories. But at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is create an energy deficit in order to achieve weight loss. We gotta, no matter how you do it, no matter what strategy we're talking about, the final common pathway is reducing energy intake and expending more calories so that we have an energy deficit. And behavior modification is essential because at the, that, that cornerstone, that, that basic goal requires um, some type of adjustment in a behavior in order to reduce calorie intake. The idea though with treatment is that we wanna make it as easy as possible for the individual to initiate and sustain that over time. So here are the quick sort of tour through what lifestyle behavioral therapy really includes or focuses on calorie reduction, changing <clears throat> how people eat, um, changing the composition of what they eat, um, using a dietary pattern like a DASH diet or an Omni Heart or a lower carb or a Mediterranean dietary pattern, 
an increase in physical activity in terms of the frequency, the intensity, or the time. Um, we want to improve cardiovascular fitness, but the main goal is to maintain good body composition during weight loss. Behavior modification focuses on a few things around changing how we process information, how we think about things. So again, if I use that example of I had a really difficult day and I know potato chips make me feel better at the end of the day, I can change how I think about that and start to say, okay, well, really what I feel is anxiety and stress, and I know that that eating those potato chips don't align with my goals, and so I'm going to go d take a walk instead because that also helps lower my anxiety and helps me stress relief. Changing how we make decisions, rerouting thought patterns. And a lot of this is about reflex, right? So for a lot of my patients, when, they, when, that, when I say birthday, they say cake, right? It's a reflex. When I say let's go to the movies, they say let's get popcorn. Right? And, and it doesn't matter whether I'm hungry or not. And so what we talk a lot about is changing the habit loop and starting to put in different cues and responding to those cues in different ways and then choosing different rewards. And that helps us start to change the pattern of behavior. What works in lifestyle behavioral therapy, you have to spend time and effort in doing it. It's not just a, I'm going to give you a one page handout and I'll see you in six months. There's a high frequency of contact that's usually associated with better outcomes. Individual and, and group behavioral counseling. Monitoring and feedback. So one of the best things you can do for your patients is to give them a food journal and say, bring this back next month completely filled out. Thank you. Fill out every day. Tell me what you ate. I don't care what it is. I just want to know what you ate, how much you ate, and when you ate it. And let's have a conversation about that next month. And I guarantee you, people who do that will have some revelation to talk to you about. People who do, do this on a regular basis and have training have better outcomes. And we don't get this training in medical school traditionally. Um, and and it's, it's, it's something that I think requires um, a certain skill set and knowledge base in order to be able to help move people along in the process. And then, yes, there's individual patient education because some patients don't have the access to nutrition knowledge and information that they need in order to be able to make better choices. What kind of outcomes do you get with lifestyle behavioral therapy? On average, you see about 5% weight loss, so around 8 kilos in 6 months with a comprehensive lifestyle intervention. These are you know, sort of our best off-the-shelf NIH tested types of interventions. This is the average amount of weight loss that you're going to see across populations of people who generally are, are motivated and, and interested in engagement. And then over time, people do pretty well with maintaining weight loss. So more than half of people are able to maintain a clinically meaningful amount of weight loss. <clears throat> so this type of treatment can be very effective and it's a great cornerstone for anybody who needs to get started with losing weight. So let me, let me move next into understanding the variability of treatment response. So <clears throat> I want you to think about it like this. Um, lifestyle behavioral therapy is very effective, um, and it has a really important place. The, the, the way I kind of wrap my head around about it, uh, around you know, the role of lifestyle behavioral therapy is, um, let's take this analogy. So I'm married happily, um, and I have uh, a lovely wife. Um, she is going on 30 for mm, the 18th time this year. Um, and I will deny it if you say that I said this. Um, and so this is a time of her life where she is moving into a different hormonal stage and everybody in the family is affected by this. Um, and so the thermostat in the house is turned down, um, even in the winter. Um, and it doesn't get really, really cold in North Carolina, but it gets cold enough where we turn on our heat usually. Uh, but not this winter. Um, and so she set the thermostat, and I don't have the power to change that. 
Lifestyle behavioral therapy is like me going to get a blanket at night if I want to stay happy. Okay? I can't change the thermostat, but I can do something different that helps me feel warmer and helps me get comfortable. Right? So in obesity, if you think about the thermostat is your brain that's controlling where your body weight is. And lifestyle behavioral therapy is the tool that helps you say, okay, I can't change the thermostat in my brain in terms of how my brain handles energy, but I can do some things that help mitigate where my brain wants that to be. So that's what lifestyle behavioral therapy does. Now, some people are going to respond to that treatment and they're gonna get a good response because the average is five to you know, 10% weight loss <clears throat> with really good therapy. Some people are gonna see 15% weight loss or even 20% weight loss, but there are gonna be some people who gain weight with the same therapy. And it's not that they didn't do it. <clears throat> so we should expect that there's gonna be variation in treatment response because there are different causes of diseases. The context is different. My life is different than your life. Different life stages, older adults versus younger adults or the difference in severity or the duration of disease. If, if I gained weight as a pregnant woman and just retained that weight, but previously I had always been normal weight, that's very different than someone who says, well, <clears throat> as a young adolescent, I started gaining weight, and by the time I was 18, I had a BMI of 35. Those are two very different things. So <clears throat> we expect variability in other treatments, right? So if I pres prescribe hydrochlorothiazide, I anticipate that there's some average treatment response with that. And if I get less than that with that particular drug, I say, okay, that was the average. I got less than that. This person is not on that same curve or they're on a different part of that curve. Then I need to augment that treatment or try something different. But if we think about obesity, we prescribe lifestyle behavioral therapy, someone doesn't get the average response, then we sort of say something like, well, they must not have been motivated because I know somebody else who did get that response. So I think <clears throat> this is an example. I, I like to pull this in because I think this is how that thinking gets codified into policy. So Medicare, Medicaid, Medicare actually covers intensive behavioral therapy for obesity. But they, they put this rule in that you have to lose a certain amount of weight by six months, otherwise they won't pay for the second six months. And the, and the reason that they say that at the bottom here is because, you know, if you haven't lost at least three kilograms during the first six months of intensive therapy, then a reassessment of their readiness to change is appropriate. If someone has come to my clinic for six months trying to work on their weight, I, I don't think I question their readiness to change. They would not have come. They would have canceled. They wouldn't have made the co-pays or spent the gas to get there. So if, if I'm doing the same thing for six months, then that's on me. I should be changing up my treatment strategy if that person hasn't had a treatment response in that time frame. So this is just a basic question, is a graph like this where each one of these little lines is an individual patient. These patients all got the same thing, but you can see the variability in treatment response with these people losing weight, these people gaining weight, these people lo not losing much of anything. Is that an issue of variation of, of they just didn't try or was it ineffective treatment or both? And I would argue that it's a little bit of both that the treatment strategy impacts the level of adherence. If you give me something that you say is the world's greatest treatment plan, but I can't do it because it's just practically impossible for me. You know, you gotta, if, I, if I said to you, you gotta wake up at 2 a.m. every morning to take this pill. You wake up at 2 a.m. every morning, it's gonna change your life, but you gotta do it. And if you're at 201, it won't work. How many of us could do that every day? Probably not, because there's going to be some challenge, even though the promise of success is really high, it's gonna be some challenge with adhering to that type of schedule. 
It's the same reason we know that people don't do well with BID meds or TID meds. When's the last time you prescribed a med that someone had to take every six hours? You don't. Even though it might be really effective, you try to avoid that type of treatment schedule because you know people have difficulty adhering to a schedule like that. It's life, right? So what happens when you introduce a calorie restriction? There's several things that happen very, very consistently. One, you start to increase hunger because your body doesn't know that you're doing this on purpose. Right? Your brain doesn't know that you are restricting calories on purpose. It thinks that somehow you traveled out of the U.S. and hit you know, some third world country and you're in a famine. It's used to regular calorie intake at a certain level and it now it senses there's something going on. And so hormones that cause you to want to eat go up like ghrelin and leptin. Then you get more energy efficient. So you do, you burn fewer calories at the same, for the same amount of work. Imagine when you first started, if you hadn't been jogging or you never ran, you decided you're gonna go out and run a mile. When you finish that first mile, your chest is burning, your legs are burning, you're barely able to make it past that one mile mark. But you practice that and you do that over and over and over again, you get better at it. There's a training effect, right? And eventually you can run that one mile in your sleep. That first time you ran that one mile, you burned 130 calories. Once you start training, you get really good at it. You know how many calories you're burning now? 90. Because your body does not perceive it to be as much work. And you combine that with a calorie restriction on top of it, your body says, hey, I gotta conserve energy because not only do you want me to keep your heart going and your brain going, but now you want me to run a mile. You gotta make some choices. And that's the last point, which is adaptive thermogenesis. This is your body saying, okay, I'm gonna start lowering your resting energy expenditure, just that amount of heat that you produce on a day-to-day -day basis, just to keep you warm, keep your temperature where it is, that nice, comfy 98.6. Right? It starts to slow that down. The amount of excess energy that you burn just to keep your body temperature where it is, that starts to go down. And so that impacts your metabolic rate. And by the way, that's how you burn 60 to 70% of your overall energy. So when you start affecting that, you're affecting your major store, your major way of burning energy. Non-response is important to identify because if people continue doing the same thing that they've been doing, they're gonna get the same outcome. And so this slide just shows you very easily, very clearly that individuals in, this, uh, in the look ahead trial who were followed out for <clears throat> eight years, they could anticipate, they could go back and predict their weight loss outcome based on their outcomes in the first month. Individuals who lost less weight in the first month are here in that blue line. They stayed there in that blue line. Versus people who lost a lot in that green line, they, they kept off more weight. The reason that we want to get past just a few pounds of weight loss is because it impacts outcomes that we care about, like sleep apnea and diabetes, or the potential to remit diabetes, right? You don't have to have type 2 diabetes. That's a complication of obesity. If you get the obesity under control, a lot of times the diabetes will go into remission. But that only happens when you get to above 10% weight loss. So nearly 15% weight loss is what you really need to have. So for non-response, <clears throat> identifying barriers of treatment implementation. So if, if, if someone's having a stressful life event and they usually have issues with emotional eating, then we gotta address that or change the strategy. Use something different. Reduce the calorie prescription. If I have you on 1,400 calories, but you're not losing weight, perhaps 1,200 calories is where we need to be. Or escalate treatment. So we do this again in other treatment strategies. Let's move to a more intensive treatment strategy. So if we're using a food-based diet, let's try a meal replacement. Or if we're using behavioral treatment only, lifestyle behavioral therapy, let's add in an anti-obesity medication. Or if we're doing behavioral and anti-obesity medication and we're not getting a treatment response, let's try surgery. 
Meal replacement, very briefly, meal replacement can be very helpful in terms of changing some of the choices that people have to make, adding structure. We've seen this in lots of different trials. More often than not, when people use more meal replacement, they see better weight loss. This is just one example of the gradient that you see in terms of people's meal replacement use in the look ahead trial. This is from the OptiWin trial, where we saw that individuals who were using a total meal replacement strategy lost about twice as much weight as individuals using a food-based diet. And again, it just makes it simple to start making choices of, that are consistent in adding structure to your intake so that you're eliminating some of the variability in terms of what you're doing on a day-in, day-out basis. Plus, there's a lot of convenience with that. Now let's move to pharmacotherapy very quickly. Pharmacotherapy, I like to think of it as doing three things. It increases the number of people who respond to a lifestyle intervention, increases the magnitude of that response, so how much weight they're going to lose, and increases the duration of that response. Those are the three things that pharmacotherapy does. It doesn't change an individual. They still have to do the groundwork. They still have to be engaged in the lifestyle behavioral therapy. It's not going to make them want to go outside and exercise, for example, right? There's no pill that does that. But if you're working on your food intake and you find that when I reduce my calories, I get really hungry and I find it hard to maintain that through the day, using this anti-obesity medication actually makes it easier for me to maintain that consistency. And then I get a treatment response. <clears throat> Pharmacotherapy increases the proportion of people who achieve clinically significant weight loss by 40 to 50 percent. And it increases the amount of weight loss by somewhere around 3 to 7 percent. So if you remember what we talked about, lifestyle behavioral therapy gets us about 5 to 8 percent weight loss. You add that, you can add that in to, you know, someone who's going to respond to that gets an additional weight loss response um, with adding pharmacotherapy. And then as long as that person is taking it, they're going to likely get benefits of that in terms of treatment response. So this is a long-term treatment strategy. Contrary to what a lot of people think, oh, I'm just going to use this medication for a boost. I hear that a lot. I, I just need a little boost to kind of get my weight loss going, and then I'll come off the medication. Well, if you stop the medication, then the likelihood is that the weight will rebound. And that's no different than any other chronic disease. Again, let's take hypertension. You put someone on a blood pressure medicine, they come back in two weeks and say, in two weeks and say, my blood pressure is great. Do you tell them to stop the medication at that point? No, you say continue the medication because as long as you take it, you will likely get benefit. Surgical intervention, briefly just re reminding people, this is primarily designed for individuals with severe obesity, so either class three, so BMI of 40 or greater, or class two with comorbidities or complications of obesity. So that's 35 plus comorbidities. And that should always be after following some type of significant structured lifestyle intervention. Primarily the restrictive procedures are sleeve gastrectomy, whereas you have restrictive plus malabsorptive that includes things like a ruin Y or duodenal switch. So if we look at what's available in terms of continuum of care, and thinking about how we look at different strategies for weight loss, then I think this should help you know, sort of give you a sense of over the course of time in, in trying to help people with obesity get a better handle on their weight, the majority of people should be getting lifestyle modification. Everybody should be getting that. And you're going to have some kind of treatment response. Then you're going to have escalating therapies like meal replacement or, or, or pharmacotherapy with a lifestyle modification to get you additional weight loss or to help people who were not responding to lifestyle alone. And then you have the, the other surgical procedures that get you additional weight loss. So a sleeve gastrectomy can get you 25 to 30 percent weight loss, whereas a ruined wide gastric bypass gets you an average of around 32 to 35 percent weight loss. But these, these are the ways that we want to be thinking about escalating treatment to give people a better chance of responding. I think the other way we want to be thinking about this is that these things should not be you know, used um, <clears throat> exclusively. So if you have surgery, it doesn't mean that you should never 
be on medication. You can actually think about the idea of someone needs medication plus surgery and that that's a good strategy for someone to potentially limit the amount of risk or improve the treatment outcome that they might have by doing both of those together. Let me give you one example of that. <clears throat> so we did this uh, small study. It was a pilot open label study with 25 people who had BMIs of 50 and higher. And interestingly enough, this in the adult population, this is the category of individuals who um, the, pre the prevalence of obesity is increasing the highest in the highest categories. So we're seeing more consistently people coming in with BMIs of 55, 60, and, and so forth. And this presents a dilemma for our surgeons because surgery is clearly the indicated treatment option, but they can't safely operate on these individuals until their BMIs often are below 50. That's preferred. Or if they're going to operate on them, then the preferred surgery would be a sleeve gastrectomy because the anesthesia time is lower and the complication rates are lower. But as I showed you previously, the amount of weight loss that you get with that particular surgery is slightly lower too. And so if you have someone that starts off with a BMI of 60, you might get them down to a BMI of 50 with a sleeve gastrectomy. That still means that they would benefit or require, could qualify for a second procedure. So what we did is we looked at this idea of, hey, what if we treated people with an anti-obesity medication both before surgery and then continued it after surgery, gave them the sleeve gastrectomy as the surgery of choice because of those issues I talked about. And let's compare that to people who just had sleeve gastrectomy alone without the benefit of the medication. And what you can see fairly easily is that in this green line, this is the people who had sleeve gastrectomy alone versus this line, these are people who had the medication plus sleeve gastrectomy. And you can see fairly clearly there's a pretty big difference in terms of the, the weight loss and the trajectory, the, the magnitude of the weight loss, um, the proportion of people who are able to get their BMI below 40 was higher in this group of individuals who are on medication. And <clears throat> this is the difference in terms of um, the amount of weight, in terms of kilograms, that you know, the difference for those individuals, and that, that's significant. That's clinically mean, meaningful. Even though these individuals lost a lot of weight, um, these individuals lost a lot more, and we saw more people able to get their BMIs actually below 30 um, in the combination treatment group. So I'm gonna finish up here, just summarize a few key points. Hopefully I've been able to convince you that obesity is a chronic disease. It's complex in nature multiple etiologies and phenotypes. Simply looking at BMI is not gonna give you very much information. And that <clears throat> we need to think about the whole patient in terms of the causes, the etiology of their obesity, and that helps inform how we go about in terms of thinking about treatment. Lifestyle behavioral therapy is critical and an important part of every treatment strategy because it is the final pathway, right? We have to reduce energy intake and we have to increase energy expenditure to create that energy deficit to lose weight. There's no other way that I know of that you can do that in terms of losing weight, but there are gonna be some people who don't respond to that treatment or they don't get an adequate treatment response or the duration of that response is not adequate. And so it's important to engage other types of treatment strategies when we see that that treatment strategy is failing. And if we use the full range of treatment options, then our patients benefit. We know that we've got other things that we can use and that increases the probability of a meaningful treatment response. Our goal as providers in terms of treating obesity is really to help make the application of the treatment easier for the patient. That's the, that's the goal, that's what I walk into the room to do is how can I make this easy for you to do so that you get the treatment response that you would like. So, that's it. This is my easiest slide. Let me see if I got questions. Let's give uh, Dr. Art a big round of applause. Wasn't that a clear presentation about the disease of obesity? So we have about 15 minutes for questions here, and then uh, Dr. Art will also join us in the panel. So if all your questions don't get answered in this round, because we will 
uh, be taking a break here in about 15 minutes. So questions uh, up here in the audience. We've got a couple up here. And uh, on the other side, go ahead and start picking up some questions here as well. And we'll move around as effectively as we can. Dr. R, thank you for that thoughtful presentation. Um, you know, it seems to me in lifestyle medicine there are two main questions, and um, you know, I, those questions are, are number one: How do you get people to adhere long term? It doesn't seem like there's a lot of good answers to that. Mm -hmm. I'm curious to know what your thoughts are on that, and, and if there's any studies on that. And then two, uh, the other problem seems to be, you know, how do you deal with this problem of metabolic slowing? You know, when, when people begin to lose weight, because that, that curve just really flattens out, and that seems to be a significant problem, too, in, in lifestyle medicine. I'm not sure if we've, we've had any good answers to that as well. Yeah. I, I think those are really um, important questions. So in terms of the longer-term adherence, I think that that becomes um, something where, you know, you start to look at the socio-ecological model and you start to think about, okay, what are the things that need to be in place in order to help a person sustain the type of behavior change and lifestyle change that, that they've initiated? Because <clears throat> it's sort of like we're, we're all in this obesogenic environment, and some of us are doing a pretty good job of fighting against that and, and managing the cues that we, we get coming in. And others of us have you know, periods of time where we do really well, and then we're overwhelmed by that environment again, and, and we find ourselves back into some old patterns. So I think there's some interesting research around the idea of, well, can we create um, communities and situations and environments that are supportive of longer-term maintenance of weight loss, and you know, imp importantly, the behaviors around that. The other thing I, I'll say that I think is at a society level is really sort of changing our structure in healthcare from being, you know, one of sick care to well care and, and being able to support, right? When's the last time you had a visit with someone where you said, hey, I just want you to come in and make sure that you're still doing the things that you need to do and I'm going to provide some support and accountability around you maintaining these lifestyle behaviors, right? I mean, th those are the types of visits that we should be paying for. Um, and, and encouraging on a regular basis in the outreach to keep people engaged so that, you know, when we find they've hit a new milestone or life situation, we can help them manage that and problem solve around that rather than waiting for the person to regain all their weight loss, all the lost weight, and then, then we've got to feel like we're starting over. On the, on the second question around, um, you know, dealing with that metabolic adaptation, I think um, that's, a, that's a whole nother talk, really, um, in terms of dealing with the weight loss plateau. Every, every individual hits a plateau, the question is, you know, is it three months or, or 12 months um, before you hit that plateau, and then how do you adjust to that? And I think one of the issues is that the science around maintenance of weight loss is still evolving, um, but it's a different type of intervention. It's, we've, we've got to think about that differently. Um, and we've got to um, understand the body's sort of natural mechanisms for responding to you know, this threat. It, again, weight loss is perceived as a threat. Um, and then employing different strategies or trying different strategies from our typical, I'm gonna hit you with this same calorie restriction and exercise protocol you know, all the time. So we're getting into things like intermittent fasting, um, time-restricted feeding, alternate day fasting as ways to sort of do things that, you know, help break out of some of those um, adaptive responses. Um, I think there needs to be more on the side of um, changing physical activity strategies in that type of adaptive response. Um, sleep is a big issue um, in that space as well um, because I think a lot of times we underappreciate the role of sleep in, in our treatment plans. Um, so I think there's a whole lot to be, you know, that we need to know, and I don't have all the, I don't have any of those answers, really. I was just wondering, with the food replacement, can that be done indefinitely? And also, how do you know if your patients are being honest about what they're actually doing at home? <laughs> yeah, the last one is easy. Um, how do you know if, if patients are being honest about what they're doing at home, you don't. Um, but I think you have to practice from the perspective that they're, they're gonna tell you the truth. 
Um, because if I walk into every room and I assume that the patient is not going to tell me the truth, then I've got no basis to be able to, you know, sort of make my next series of recommendations. Um, I do have lots of conversations with people that, you know, start off with, you know, I, this is what I expected. This is what we're seeing. Is there anything that I'm missing? And, you know, that just sort of gives them a sense of like, yeah, I understand there's variability in, in how, you know, people respond to certain treatments. Um, and that's okay. Um, can you use meal replacement long term? Yes. So usually what we will do is in patients who have used meal replacement as part of their weight loss strategy, we will recommend one to two uh, meal replacements per day for maintenance. And a lot of my patients will say, yeah, if I don't have the meal replacement first thing in the morning, then I find myself going through the drive through or making a poor choice or just skipping breakfast altogether. So it's a great way for me to get started. And then I find that you know, mid-afternoon, it's a really convenient way for me to get a snack rather than going to the vending machine. So again, it's about making the healthy choice the easy choice. I want you to put it where you think it's going to make it easier for you to stay consistent with the choices that you want to make. Yes. This is another one of those, uh, it deserves another lecture questions, sure. but with the lifestyle behavioral therapy being foundational, um, it's also very complicated and kind of the farthest from our traditional medical treatment model um, and uh, fraught with controversies and, and that sort of thing. Um, so I, I'm interested in any comments you may have about, you know, strategies that have worked at your center in trying to design a program, but also any out of the box uh, kind of solutions that you would point people to as a, a good way to go in their practice? Yeah, so I, I totally agree. I think um, lifestyle behavioral therapy as it's currently conceived um, in, the, in the sort of real, you know, sort of translational fidelity to, you know, where the original study was to, to you know, putting it in the community is very resource intensive, right? As, as I said before, it's high frequency of contact. You have to have trained expertise to, to be able to deliver the intervention um, effectively. Um, and that that is beyond the scope of what most people have access to in their day-to-day -day practices. So what we often recommend in that setting is doing a few key things that help um, really sort of one, assess where that person is in terms of being ready to address obesity um, and initiate treatment. Some people are still contemplating, some people are ready to go, they just need a little nudge. Um, we also think that um, primary care providers can do a really good job of referring to commercial programs or community-based programs. So if you have a TOPS program, for, for example, taking off pounds sensibly, or if you know of a good Weight Watchers type program or WW program, um, or some other program, get to know a program or two that you can feel confident re recommending to people. And then I think the third thing is um, getting people some key behaviors to start doing and then recommend follow-up. Um, and I mentioned the journaling piece of that. I think that's a really good place to start for a lot of providers. And then <clears throat> if you don't, feel comfortable with initiating anti-obesity medication as a treatment option, um, then find a provider who does a referral source where you can um, help your patients navigate that. Because there's a lot of stuff out there in the community, right? People are promising weight loss and, you know, they're putting pins in people's ears and giving them, you know, weird shots and stuff like that. And you, you want to at least guide your patients away from those types of things to something that's much more evidence-based. I think if you can do those things, that fulfills a really, you know, important role, even if you don't see yourself as being um, on the front line of like, yeah, I'm going to treat all my patients who have obesity with a comprehensive, complex, you know, type of treatment program. Thank you. We have a question over on this side here. Oh, okay. So I thought you had a question there. Oh, I forgot my gentleman right here. <laughs> we have to be fair about this. Could you please comment on the role of uh, gut bacteria, if any, mm -hmm. and also uh, the role of uh, intermittent fasting as a way of inducing ketogenesis to lose weight? 
Yeah, so the, the microbiome is um, the hot topic these days. No matter where you go, um, which conference you're, you're involved in, there's, there's a microbiome discussion. Um, in, in clinical practice, my sense is it's not gotten to the point where it's made a, a difference in terms of how we think about either diagnosing or treating. Um, we may get there someday, um, and, but I think we've got to better understand the variability in the microbiome, the individual's microbiome, and um, interaction between their food intake and, and the uh, gut bacteria. Um, with regard to intermittent fasting, the, the data that we have in humans related to weight loss, basically what we know is that it's uh, similar in terms of its effectiveness compared to a, a chronic uh, daily calorie restriction. Um, and what we do or, or how we think about it is, you know, it may be an ideal behavioral approach for some people because they might find that um, I can wrap my head around for today, I've got to reduce my calorie intake and, and get it low. But if I had to do that every day for the week, then that might be discouraging. But I can do it today because I know tomorrow I can eat a higher calorie intake. And so I've got some patients who that appeals to them. Um, but metabolically, I haven't seen any information that suggests that, oh, this is a superior approach to a you know, daily calorie restriction or a modified you know, intake in terms of composition of, of food and, and so forth. So, but there, there's still you know, a number of human studies that are yet to be um, uh, analyzed and published um, that I know are going on. And so hopefully we'll get more information soon um, regarding the different types of intermittent fasting. One question. Uh, you mentioned uh, leptin and ghrelin as uh, potential uh, difficulties in trying to get people to lose weight. Have there been any studies of uh, either lifestyle interventions or medication that would interfere with the release of some of those hormones? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> actually leptin was, was thought of as um, sort of the holy grail, so to speak. We thought we, we actually had figured this out when um, people published papers looking at um, leptin deficient mice and saw that you know this mouse you know really has an increased weight and, and so the thought was if we replace leptin these you know that will solve obesity um, because there's also this you know sort of issue of lower leptin uh, levels in individuals with obesity um, the problem is that uh, it doesn't seem to work so there were studies using a drug called metroleptin, which was basically designed to help overcome the quote-unquote leptin resistance in individuals with obesity, and it <clears throat> um, did not work at all. It actually failed fairly spectacularly. Um, and I think that the ghrelin issue, um, the best that we know is in our surgical interventions when we remove part of the stomach, we see a real drop in ghrelin level and, and that ghrelin level doesn't seem to come back up to the pre-surgery uh, levels. Um, and it may be just because we cut out the stomach, you know, part of the stomach that, you know, makes the ghrelin um, and signals the, the, the brain in terms of hunger. Um, or it could be some other sort of definitive uh, mechanism there. Um, but ghrelin may also just be a marker of the fact that you're actually restricting calories. And, the, and there's, a, there's a group of people who sort of feel like, well, it's, it's not really driving the, you know, sort of hunger per se, but it just may be a marker of the fact that you're restricting calories and it's going to go up in response to that. Um, and if you blocked it, it wouldn't really change anything. Um, so, no, we don't really have any hormonal level types of drugs. The best we have right now are GLP-1 receptor agonists. So you increase GLP-1 levels using these drugs um, they delay gastric emptying, but they also have some satiety effects in the brain uh, centrally. Um, but that's, that's the most that we have in terms of these, these uh, incredent mimetics. Let's thank Dr. Art again.